Hiya, Fennel here from FennelSpirey.com. Well, it's raining outside, so we're having a rare video in my study. I'm busy at the moment signing the letters and the limited edition versions of my new magazine. So this one's out at the moment. This is called Book of Secrets. It's a collection of prequels that knit the whole Fennel's Journal series together. So this has a number of chapters, each chapter of which is a prequel to one book within the series. I've been working all morning signing these. I've done about 100 so far. Uh, I'm averaging about one tonnex tea cake for about 15 journals. Um, and I think I'm on my third cup of tea. So if you come round, I'll quickly show you this magazine. There's about 20 of them left for sale at the moment. I haven't all quite sold out yet, but they will do soon. And for those of you who've been collecting these over the years, these are the prequels for the or previews rather, for the books that will come out later in the year. So Book of Secrets is currently available as a magazine. This will be available in about six months maybe as a proper book for you to buy. So come on over, have a look at the chapters inside. Okay, so here we are, the limited edition collector's magazine version of Fennel's Journal. Each book in the series originally came out as a magazine. I started publishing them in about 2012. So if you're lucky, you've been collecting these since they first came out. This is the last but one to come out in magazine format, it's a penultimate one. It's a prequel of the book that will come out later in the year. So tail end of 2018, Book of Secrets will be available in hardback and paperback. But for now, if you want a sneak peek, you can do so by reading the magazine. 600 are produced, of which the first 100 are signed by me and embossed with the Fennel's Priory logo. So, my introduction, my little signature, and the Fennel's Priory logo embossed, all by me, all done by hand. I should say this is actually an entirely handmade production, folded by hand, stapled by hand, guillotined by hand, shipped out by hand, carried by me in boxes to the post office and sent out. <laughs> Very much a niche production compared to the books we're now doing. Anyway, each chapter in Book of Secrets forms a prequel to a book in the Fennel's Journal series. So the Journal series, 14 books in total, covering a 10-year period of my life and covering a number of different subjects. They're kind of themed around those subjects. And Book of Secrets gives the reasons why I themed each book the way I did. It provides either the backstory and the context to the book that then follows or it provides an explanation of the metaphor within the book. So not always uh, is, is the book really about what you think it might be about. And this book actually gives the explanation what it's really all about and the story and the message that I want you to take from it. So each chapter forms a prequel to one of the books in the series. The first chapter here is called The Wedding Speech That Never Was. And that's a prequel to A Meaningful Life. It gives, or I states, the wedding speech that I was due to have read back in 2003. If you've read A Meaningful Life, you'll know that the whole Funnels Journal story was triggered by uh, uh, somewhat of a shock moment when I was stood up at the altar. And it forced me to reassess my life. This gives the speech that I was going to read then, but didn't. I kept it sealed until recently and was quite shocked at what I'd written actually when, when I wrote it. It's definitely not me. Which made me think that actually the, the trigger point for Fennel's journal started many years before. The spiral into something else started many years before. And this story gives the context of when I actually think it did begin. And it sets you up for the series as it begins with A Meaningful Life. The second chapter is called Seeing the Lake for the Trees. And this provides the uh, a secret. So what it actually says is that Fennel's journal was actually written slightly later than I perhaps said. So it, A Meaningful Life was written in 2006, or part of it was. What I actually did was take time out, go and live by a lake, camping, spending a load of time writing, writing both what happened during that year, during 2007, when I wrote A Waterside Year, and also 
expanding out and rewriting a lot of the material from the previous year. So a meaningful life and a waterside year were both pretty much written in 2007 when I spent best part of a year living beside this lake in Worcestershire, taking time out, enjoying nature, enjoying some reboot time to help me put everything in focus. And that's when I shaped, plotted out, planned 10 years worth of writing, journals, all the activities to rebuild my life, pay off debts, to get me to where I should have been if I'd followed or stayed true to myself earlier in my life. The third chapter is called Finding One's Voice, and that's a prequel to the book A Writer's Year. And this talks about the importance of writing to me, why I seek to be a writer and why I need to be honest and truthful to the message, that this stop and plug, escape and joy message that's central to everything that I do. But it also gives a sort of behind the scenes view of an acknowledgement that writing's only half of it. Putting the message down on paper or on a blog or wherever it may be is only half of it. The other half is that you've actually got to get people to find your work. So there's no good writing thousands of blogs if nobody knows they exist. So it looks at how I can relate to an audience, attract an audience, be there for them, and some of the thoughts and also fears and challenges that I have in actually switching from being an introvert to an extrovert in going out there and being right in front of people. The next chapter is called Journey of Discovery and Recovery, and this is the prequel to my book Wild Carp. So the book version of Wild Carp will prob probably be the largest book in the series. And that's because it covers 20 years of my life, starting when I was at school, right up to when I was in my mid-30s. And it was my adventure going in search of a very old strain of fish here in the UK that are really quite rare. And it also, in this chapter, gives the reasons why I did that. So I'd started back in the, in the late 80s on this adventure and started writing this book in the late 80s. And then the, the man who was helping me on that journey, a guy called Mike Winter, it, he got took ill. He was taken ill and couldn't be with me on that adventure. He, he was sort of laid up in hospital. So I decided to write about this adventure and write some fishing books. So the Fennel's Journal series, 14 books in the series, three of them are about fishing. It's kind of like a sort of unusual blip in the middle. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily follow, uh, follow through everything else I'm writing, but I wrote them for Mike. He was bed bound, he couldn't go fishing, he loved fishing, he loved gardening. He couldn't go and do the things that he loved. So I decided to write about them. And completing my quest for the ultimate wild carp water was something I decided to do to inspire Mike to encourage him, to help him back into health. And this story gives the context of how I decided to resume a quest I'd started nearly 20 years before to go and find that perfect water to inspire my friend. Okay. The second of the three fishing stories is in relation to uh, the book called uh, fly fishing. The magazine I think was called The Upstream Dryer changed it to call, be called fly fishing. It was just more obvious. And it gives my context of fly fishing in my life. So it's the first thing I ever did as an angler when I was six, seven, eight years old. And it was something that Mike Winter liked to do. So I decided to also spend a year writing about fly fishing. But the fly fishing that I write about in the book isn't really the sort of fly fishing I tend to do these days. It, it's slightly uh, traditional style rivers, lakes type fishing. Whereas actually the sort of fly fishing that I'm inspired by now and, and back in the day, I think it was nine, 2009 when I wrote fly fishing, it was, it was much more sort of bushcraft. It was more about the escapism, the adventure, the getting away from it all, getting back to basics, fishing as simply and purely as possible with the least amount of kit 
that enables me to walk further from the car and have these discoveries that other people may not have had. But I was conscious back in 2009 that that was probably a little bit too radical for my readers. I hadn't shared all those thoughts with Mike either. So I wrote the book Fly Fishing in a traditional style. But I captured it in this chapter called Escapism and Adventure to say, this is where I'm at, this is where I'll ultimately be, but I need to take my readers on a journey. So there's a little bit there explaining what, what I term as bushcraft fly fishing. A little bit in there. And that's probably a subject about which I'll write in a, in a few years' time, and there may well be a book on it. The third of the three fishing books, and this is a, a prequel in, the, in Book of Secrets called Traditional Angling Evolution, is, is sort of a confession in that uh, you know, I'm known as a traditional angler. Bamboo rods, centre bin reels, tweedy coats, fat cap, all that stuff. And people latch on to the tackle element of traditional angling. They think it's all about the vintage tackle. It, it, it really isn't. It's more of a mindset that says, do you know what, it doesn't really matter if we catch fish or not, we just enjoy being there. And therefore, prior to writing traditional angling, the, the book Traditional Angling, I wrote this chapter, it's called Traditional Angling Evolution, it forms a prequel, and it's a confession that says, much of the material, many of the chapters that are in traditional angling were written many years before. They're actually written in 2008, when I was really fired up about traditional angling, you know, fishing with Chris Yates at, at Jade Lake and with the Golden Scale Club and, you know, Bernard Venables, Mr. Crabtree goes fishing a guy, you know, good mate. And they're all helping me thinking through what angling means to me and everything. And I captured a lot of that in a series of articles, which I then stuck in a drawer and forgot about. <laughs> and then I took them out again and compiled them, sent them as letters to Mike when he was poorly, and then assembled them into the book, Traditional Angling. But that was then and this is now. So I wrote the book Traditional Angling in 2010. So 12 years earlier, I'd written the content for it, but I'd moved on. I knew that it wasn't all about the tackle. I knew that it was more about the mindset, the sporting ethics, the just being there. And that really, I wasn't especially using that much traditional gear either. You know, at that time, mostly fly fishing, if I'm honest, where I was using more of the sort of carbon rods and stuff like that, rather than necessarily the bamboo stuff. So this is a, a debate a confession which looks at old tackle, new tackle, mindset, traditional angling, modern angling, and where I am now. Okay, so in, in case people read traditional angling and think of me as being the ultimate absolute purist of you have to use vintage gear, I'm not. Use what suits you, use what's best and appropriate for the task, use what's comfortable, use what's right and that makes angling good for you. But always, always appreciate the peripheries of angling the nature, the wildlife, the getting away from it all, the escapism, the unwinding, the relaxing, and how it all enhances your life and makes you feel better. That's what this is about. The next chapter is the prequel to the book called The Quiet Fields. And this was my homage to BB, who wrote a book of the same title. And this is about the, the fact that when we go into wild places and into nature, it enables us to reflect on who we are as much as where we are. So it's about the nature that's within us as much as around us. And this is me saying, I've probably done enough books on fishing now, kind of done on that. I want to reboot the series, get back to the message, pick up where I'd left off with a waterside year with a lot of the nature observations of being by water and do a natural history uh, book that captures the seasons, captures how it affects us, captures how it inspires us into making us want to go outdoors. Next chapter called The Finest Things is the prequel to the book called Fine Things. And if you read Fine Things, you'll know that it's all about those special sentimental things that we can have around us that remind us of who we are, why we are, they inspire us into being true and honest to ourselves and they mean something, they have that sentimental value. 
but they're very much about the things that are around me, not necessarily the finest of things. Now, now obviously, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father. The finest things of me are, are my wife and my daughter. So there's a piece in there about them, which I don't normally tend to be that upfront about private life, but it, it's in there. But also, it gives the context to why I wrote that book as I did. Now, right at the beginning of the Fennel's Journal series with A Meaningful Life, I allude to the breakdown that triggered me to reflect. It, it caused a load of depression and feeling sorry for myself, which I then dug myself out of that dark place or climbed out of that dark place by writing and reflecting and exploring. But, to be honest, I, I was pretty ill then, or was not right. 2003, after this, this breakdown, 2003, 2004, I was very, very ill. And I had a, a sort of wake up and an awakening whereby I looked around my room and, and prior to that didn't recognise myself, didn't know where I was, who I was, all this sort of quite heavy stuff. But then I started to observe things and I observed the things around me that I hadn't sold. So after my breakdown, I was left with huge debts, which I had to pretty much sell everything that I owned. I didn't keep many things, but I, those things I did keep, I kept in my room. So that when I finally came round, I looked at them and wondered, why did I keep those when I'd sold everything else? What was special and sentimental about them? And what does that tell me about myself? So this chapter talks about what those things were, what they mean to me, and why you'll see me doing those things, wearing those things, surrounded by those things today. The next chapter in Book of Secrets is called The Roots of Life. This is the prequel to A Gardener's Year. And for those who know me, I've always been quite upfront by the fact that my book called A Gardener's Year is only superficially about gardening. So sure, you can read it as a collection of gardening stories that cover my 20 year career in horticulture. But more importantly, A Gardener's Year is a metaphor for having a dream, staying true to that dream, pursuing that dream and seeing one's life and one's ambitions in a similar way to gardening in that you have an idea, you plant the seed, you nurture the seed, you grow, you, it matures, it becomes a, a eventually a self-sustaining plant that doesn't need any looking after. And that's the metaphor in A Gardener's Year and that's what I explain in The Roots of Life. The next chapter in Book of Secrets is called Reaching for Dreams and this is what I wrote in 2004 and it's the prequel to a book called The Lighter Side. Now, sorry, 2014 I wrote this. So 2014, the year I wrote The Lighter Side was a very tricky year for me because that marked the 10 year anniversary of when I decided to reboot my life. You know, 2004 through to uh, that year, I'd had a 10 year plan to pay off debts, get my cottage in the country, resume that sort of idyllic rural life. And on paper, that's what I did. I bought a lovely cottage in the Cotswolds. I could walk from my back garden for nearly six miles before I got to the next house. It was remote, it was idyllic, it was, it was supposed to be perfect, but it wasn't. And this chapter explains why it wasn't in a way that the book, A Lighter Side, doesn't. So the book is very much focused on, okay, it went wrong, it didn't go to plan, there was some awkward stuff that made me rethink where I was going with this, this sort of rebuilding honest, truthful life. This gives the before and the after view of that year. So it's in two parts. Part one is called Of Geese and Grass and it's about this is the year that's going to come. This is what I wrote at the beginning of 2014 before I moved house and set up that new life and saw it unfold. Part two, which is called Survival, was written at the end of that year and that's the honest confession and the mature confession on me and the realisation that 
I'd spent 10 years building or rebuilding my life. I'd gone back to a reboot point in my life, which is about 1995, 96, when I was first known as Fennel, when I was working as a gardener on a country estate, when I had a little cottage, when I had a very oldie worldy life, a simple life, just gardening and living on this thousand acre English country estate. And so I'd spent, since 2004, 10 years clawing back to rebuild that sort of life. And as much as I loved it and as much as it inspired me and was right for the true character who I am, it was absolutely wrong for my family. And this half of the chapter explores how I got it so wrong, how living so remotely may well have been fine for me, but was just not right for my family and all the conflict that that caused and all the sadness that that caused and the reflection that actually at the end of it, we're going to do things differently. So a great deal of honesty in this chapter. The next chapter called Friendship Matters is the prequel to friendship. And this, without giving too much away, gives a secret story about why I was so passionate about doing a, a, a special book about friendship. And it's, uh, if you see the picture, it's in relation to this guy here. That's Mike Winter, my friend whom I'd, I'd written the three fishing books about. Finally, uh, up and about, no longer bedridden, but in a wheelchair. And this is a group of people called the Golden Scar Club. We decided that we would produce a book for him and the royalties could then go towards his care. I spent several years pulling that book together. Sadly, it never happened. The chapter goes into the reasons why it may not have happened. Nobody knows for sure, but it didn't. But it does capture my commitment that says, if these guys couldn't do it, I know another group of friends who definitely could. And create a book that I could then share with Mike and say, here you go. This is about friendship. This is what friendship means. This is what can be done when true friends pull together, share their passions and write about a variety of things, but which together has that continuity and that thread that says, we're friends, this is what we talk about, this is what we write about. Here, we've produced this book for us and also for you, my friend. This chapter here is called Making the Escape and it's the prequel to the book called Nature Escape. So, second book in the series, earlier in the series was the Waterside Year and that was a, a, a year long, or well, nearly a year long escape into nature. I decided after Escaping the Cotswold in 2014, having finally set the record straight on the friendship book, that I needed a, a second escape. Now, father, husband, job, mortgage, all that stuff, very much didn't have the luxury of going and spending a year living in a tent by a lake again. But I did get the opportunity, Mrs H's little lady away from home for a weekend, I did get the opportunity to go and spend 24 hours in a woodland in late spring. Just 24 hours, all for me, in a place I love, in a, in a mature, deciduous English woodland, to just immerse myself in nature. This is the story about the lead up to that, about why and how I could get that, the sort of escape and the fix I wanted in just 24 hours, but also the journey of truth and honesty in oneself, things we do for others, things we do for ourselves, and the reward we can get when we do get a small chance just to you know, simply just do something for us. Okay, it's very much about freedom, which I always associate with autonomy. If I have the, the autonomy to do things that I want, when I want, how I want, that defines freedom for me. And at that moment in time, there was nothing I wanted more than just being able to go and spend 24 hours alone in a woodland surrounded by 
bird life, spring flowers, deer, animals, starlit skies, the whole thing. No tent. So on one hand it could be seen as uncomfortable, but it wasn't. It was fantastic. So that's the prequel to the book Nature Escape that will be coming out later this year. And then we have quite a big confession. <laughs> There's a chapter called The Secrets We Keep, which is the prequel to this book, Book of Secrets. OK, so Book of Secrets gives a prequel to each of the books in the Fennel's Journal series. This one explains that actually the series was kind of shaped by a mistake. There's 14 books in the series. It's driven by the binder that once held these magazines. And when I commissioned the binder, beautiful leather bound, gold embossed thing, uh, built to a 17th century design, I commissioned it saying it's got to hold all of them. It's got to hold every edition, all of these magazines together, all 14 editions. <laughs> Which of course, I didn't realise until it was made that actually at the time there were only 13 magazines in the series. <laughs> So I suddenly thought, I need to do another one. And all I knew was that I'd got this title uh, about secrets and I needed to fill the magazine. So that, that's the sort of confession in this, in that actually there needed to be this magazine to complete the binder. But it gave me an opportunity to explain that metaphor that I'd alluded to and provide the continuity that joins one journal, one book to the next. And it also gives a, a very, very black and white explanation that so there's no confusion exactly what each of the books is about, the, the main message within it. OK, and then there are two, five, two chapters that relate to books in the Fennel's Journal, but they're books that aren't magazines. So, as I said, there was a binder that could house 14 of these. When nature escapes out, there will be all 14 magazines done, dusted, finished. That's that era of Fennel's Journal complete. They'll all be nicely housed in that binder. So this chapter called Moonlight Perspective is the prequel to a book called The Pursuit of Life. And The Pursuit of Life will be a story within a story. It's the it's my personal reflection on what that 10 year rebuild in my life's all been about the openness and also a glimpse of the other side of that life so fennel's journal writing it for me has always been an escape it's enabled me to write or do things that balance other things in my life so things like clearing nearly 100 grand's worth of debt took me 10 years to do that I had to work incredibly hard, sacrifice a lot in terms of not being with my family, traveling, working away from home, all these things that I don't tend to write about in the journal. I allude to it, pressures of work, that sort of thing, but never really said exactly what had to be done. And The Pursuit of Life talks about the extent to which some of my sacrifices have at times made me question whether I'm on the right track whether being 8,000 miles away from home in, in Asia is right when my daughter's poorly at home. But then I combat that by perhaps going and doing a little bit of fishing for catfish in Singapore, for example. But there was a time this year, sorry, last year, 2017, when the Pursuit of Life book starts to take shape. It's when I had to, was forced to go and get another job when book sales weren't quite as they should have been. I wasn't making enough money from my writing and I had to go and get a job. And it meant going away from home again. And it was a dark time, hence the black paper. But I wrote this piece uh, in the middle of the night while living in a tent down in the New Forest, a beautiful moonlit night, starry sky that was absolutely wonderful. And it gave me a slightly different perspective in that Life is what you make of it. It's the perspective you give upon any situation, how you interpret events and the story you tell yourself. 
which is kind of the thread that goes through the book The Pursuit of Life. And then finally, this is a book of secrets, so I'm asking you now to keep a secret. All the way through and over the past decade, I've always said there are 14 books in the Fenris Journal series. Uh, there's not. There's actually 15. And the 15th book is not available for sale. It can only be given by me as a present in return for a noble deed. A noble deed that supported me in what I'm doing at Fenris Priory supported me in Fennel's journal, so you may have bought all the books in the series, put a, uh, a photo of it up on social media, for example, let me know about it and say, here, I've been loyal to you throughout, I've bought all your books. And you may well get a book in return. And that book is called The One You Can't Buy. And it's a collection of stories that didn't go into Fennel's journal earlier, all of which are bound by a common theme, which is we do things or should do things on our terms. I have one of my rules that says, never do anything that offends your soul. Only do things on your terms. So even if it seems on face value that we're having to make a big sacrifice, do it on your terms. So for example, if I've got to go and work away from home to earn money to send home for my family, then I'm not gonna stay in a business hotel. I'm gonna live in my teepee in a wood and do all the nature stuff that I love. Those are my terms. So the one you can't buy, it's full of stories like that to inspire you to define your terms and it gives the stories of which and examples of which where I've done it, where on, on paper, on, on first face value that you think, why is he doing this? But actually you get under the skin of it and you think, I can see why he's doing it on his terms. So the big secret at the end of Book of Secrets is that there are 15 books in the Final Journal series, not 14 but the 15th book is only available to be given as a gift by me. And then finally, there is a chapter called Always For You. Everything I write, all of Fennel's journal has been written for you. And specifically that you is my daughter, little lady. She's too young to read them now, but at some point in her future, she will be old enough to both read Fennel's journal and understand what it means. And it should be there for her throughout her life, throughout her children's life, forever. So when I'm no longer around and maybe she misses me or she needs a bit of fatherly advice or a bit of encouragement or some inspiration or guidance on how to think about things, she can turn to Fennel's journal to see what daddy wrote about for her with her own unique interpretation of everything. That's what that chapter's about. It's the hardest thing I've ever written. It took me about three weeks to write this one page. <laughs> I kept having to start with a flood of tears. But I got there in the end and completed it for a little lady. And for you as well, for when you, re when you read it. And that's it. And the back cover is uh, of a beach in, in Wales called Marlow Sands. That's where we often go on holiday. It's a little uh, our family escape. So whereas on the front cover, this was my private escape. This is a lake in Oxfordshire where I could just disappear to go and sit on that little bench there next to the boathouse, hear a waterfall coming from the lake above and just unwind and let the sound of the beach, the wind in the beech trees just brush over me and everything would just fall away, all that stress would go. That's my cover. The back is my family's cover. So that's Book of Secrets, a talk through chapter by chapter that gives an introduction to each book in the Fennel's Journal series. It's available now in magazine. There's about 20 copies left. Grab one, grab one while you can, but it will be available in hardback and paperback, an e-book later in 2018. Thanks for your patience in watching that. Time now for me to have another Tonics tea cake and finish my cup of tea. Thanks for watching.